Because how much would it suck if I went home and I lost your sound? I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would be so sad. You'd have to come back. I'd have, well, I am going to come back. I'm going to shoot that boot camp video for you. Cool. Remember? Cool. Yeah. Can leather be sustainable? Like, you're into sustainability, yes. but you also do leather, and people yes. think that that does not mesh up. No. We, we, well, it depends. It depends. It depends. Um, we are using, for example, I will use hides if the animal was not killed for it. So, how do you figure that out? Um, well, I, I don't buy um, fur hides. Um, okay. okay. I mean, there's some things that are really obvious. I and mean, if you know mm -hmm. leather, you know, like astrakhan, you don't... Okay, I'm sorry. I'm not going to use astrakhan, mm -hmm. all right? I'm not going to use... Um, I mean, that's fetal lamb, right? You mm -hmm. know that. My viewers do now. Okay, yes. Well, they, well, I think you forget you're not really talking to me, but you're talking to okay. my viewers who okay. are astrakhan, far less than I do. Okay, astrakhan means they kill the baby lamb before it's born, like within three days of it being born, and they skin it. And that's where, the, that's where that curly, you know, that beautiful mm -hmm. hide comes from. Curly, beautiful hide. Mm -hmm. It's from a fetal lamb. So we don't, uh, personally, here. well, we've been, I've been a vegetarian for many years, many, mm -hmm. many years. So I only work on hides that the animal was not killed for their hide. And that basically means pig, mm -hmm. you know, cow, um, elk, mm -hmm. deer, you know, it's, it's not hard. Um, Can you ask the tanner, are they, they, are they supposed to tell you? If no, but nobody's going to kill a pig for anything but food. <laughs> Nobody kills a cow for anything but food. You know, and those hides would just go into the into the uh, landfill. So what I'm about gonna, lamb? lamb? People eat lamb, but it is a baby animal. Y yes, yeah, I know. But then there, you get into the whole discussion of okay, is it is it okay to eat animals as long as you're nice to them? Yeah, I mean, you know what I mean. So yeah, I, I'm, I can't have that discussion. So the thing is, is a lamb um, is eaten by a lot of people. Lamb is eaten by a lot of people. So mm -hmm. I will work with a hide that the animal is killed. It's a food animal. Okay. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. And mink, you know, even, I mean, have you ever met a mink? They're nasty, nasty, nasty animals. Oh, no, I've not so, met a mink. mink. Yeah, they're nasty creatures. So, I mean, I could almost see working with one of those, <laughs> you know, because they're so vile. Yeah, they're really mean. Are so, you an Albuquerque native? No. When did you move out here? Well, how, when did I move out here? That's so funny. Um, I moved out here um, 28 years ago. 28 years ago. Yeah, and I never thought about moving here either. It was one of those things I haven't ever told anybody publicly. But You don't have to share if you're not comfortable. Well, I mean, the statute of limitations is over. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 seriously, I was married to somebody that I shouldn't have been married to. It was a very oh. bad person, it was a very, very bad person. And, um, and I literally was going into the witness protection program. I know, I know. And you tell people that, and it's, it seems like the opening of a big scam, but... Yeah, it's kind of, it's not what people think. Going into the witness protection program is not like in the movies at all. And um, it's like a six month process. It take, it, it's not, you know, it takes, it takes a long time. You have to mm -hmm. go in front of a judge. You've got to do all this stuff. It's crazy. So, but anyway, yeah, so um, I was in the process of doing that, but then um, the, where I was being held, the safe house I was being held, my husband found out where I was because he was paying off the police. And so I'm freaking out and I'm screaming, basically. I'm screaming because mm -hmm. he's going to come and kill me and, and our son. And um, so they got me out of there. They, um, the feds, basically, they put me, they came over and they said, we have to get you out of the state as quickly as possible. You need to be gone. And um, so they said, um, they said, where do you want to go? And they would name off places. I had to go someplace where I'd never been before, mm -hmm. where they didn't know anybody and I'd never lived. So they would name, and it had to be a place where there was a federal courthouse. Okay. There had to be a federal courthouse. Okay. You know, for this thing. So they would name, I think they named off Minneapolis and Chicago and all these places. I'm like, God, no, I don't want to go there. It's cold. 
it's cold and, and all that, and uh, we couldn't figure, we couldn't, and I'm like freaking out because I'm trying not to, you know, panic. Die? Yeah. Yeah. So they put a blindfold on me, and they put me in front of a map of the United States, and they said, pick a spot, and my finger landed on Albuquerque. And they took off my mask, and it was on Albuquerque, and they said, do you know anybody there? No. Have you ever been there? No. Do you know anything about it? No. I was on a plane to Albuquerque in four hours. I would land in Albuquerque between that time and four hours. Oh my God. Yeah, that's how I ended up in Albuquerque. What? That's how I ended up here. And I ended up when I was in the battered women's shelter. I lived there with my son for about six months. My son was very, very ill at the time and he was in the hospital almost all the time. So I couldn't even get a job because he was so sick all the time. Oh. And we had just come back from South America, and they thought that it might have been something that uh -huh. he got there. They just couldn't figure out ever what was wrong with him. He just, you know, he'd, he'd um, be in the hospital for two weeks, and then he'd come out for a day or two, and he'd go back in. It was just, it was just horrible. But anyway, so you know, I kind of just stayed. It's like you know, Albuquerque is really screwed up. It's a really screwed up kind of place, but it's it's got its own charm, and it's like you know. You know, they took us in. You know, mm -hmm. we were refugees. You know, the city mm -hmm. took us on. They made a way for us. They made a home for us. And, you know, I'm just, I'm just paying it back. Mm. You know? But there's other places I could go. It'd be a lot easier to make a living. And But somebody's got to stay down and hold down the fort. <laughs> right? Wow. Yeah. You know, like, I told you how... Like, my long-term goal was to travel the world teaching. Because, mm -hmm. like, I want to know, like, one of the things about that is I want to see how the industry functions in all these areas. And, like, if I were to come to a university out here, and, he like, I would love to hear stories about how the industry functions here. As opposed to, like, you know, everyone has these ideas of, like, oh, you know, summer in Italy, and that's all grand and everything. But I also want to go where people are just making stuff. Like, I want to see all the sections. That's why I love checking out factories like yours, because I want to see... So you're going to come for boot camp, and then that'll be incredible. Oh, my God, I'm so excited. I have it on my calendar already. We're doing it. We're that's going to be great. Oh, my God. And tell you people if they're going to sign up for that, it fills up super fast, like, within 18 hours. Oh, so we need to tell them about boot camp because we don't have any of that on camera. Okay. So please tell uh, my viewers slash students okay. about your boot camp program. Okay. So we do manufacturing boot camp twice a year, and we um, it's it's for charity. Nobody makes any money on it. As a matter of fact, my company loses a lot of money on it. But basically, what we do is we bring in people for four days. And we, bring, we take anybody, whoever signs up. In other words, somebody who has no experience and somebody who has a lot of experience. But basically, we take and we create a product during that time. I mean, we've had the patterns and all that stuff done ahead of time. But we will spread the fabric, cut and sew it over four days and, you know, do this. So, for example, this is what we made last fall. As we, made the, we make coats every fall. So we bring in 20 to 25 people to make 100 or more coats. So and they're and they're nice. So they've got you know got a collar, they've got facings, they've got zippers. Um, you know it's a nice quilted lining. They're fully lined. We make. Um, they have pockets. They have this um, reflective tape because the kids who live in the areas where we make these where we send these coats don't have any uh, infrastructure. You know, rib knit cuffs that last the kid for a while. That is so clever. I was just like, when I first saw it, I was like, oh, that's cute. But no, it, it has a purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then right here, um, in this sleeve right here, is a little zip pocket. This is for the kids to put, like, their lunch money or their house keys or something right here. Oh. So they like to have one zip pocket. So that's just in the one sleeve. Nice. So we made these, a uh, hundred of these in uh, blue and black. So this is one colorway. That was the blue was the one colorway, and then the black is the other colorway. Mm -hmm. And we're very particular. Um, see, this I only have these products because they're defective. What's defective about those? 
Um, this one, you bring your camera way over here so you can see this. There's a little tiny, the, the ribbing didn't get sewn in there correctly. Ah, uh, okay. So that, but otherwise this one is perfect. This one is because the, see this box stitching around the waist? On this waistband tab, mm -hmm. it doesn't go up all the way. So if we don't charge anything, we don't charge for the boot camp. It's not a class or anything per se. People mm -hmm. have to kick in money so we can buy fabrics. Mm -hmm. So we can buy fabrics, ribbing, all the materials that go into it. It's catered. So so we we do collect money from people who come, but as a way to cover the expenses of the event itself. So nobody makes money on this. And the other reason why we do it is because we give people, there's a lot of people that want to learn how to run factories. And it's not, the, these are younger people, and, and there's really no way for that. It's not like it was when, when I got out of school where you just got a job in a factory. Mm -hmm. Figure out how to start. There's no factories for people to get jobs in anymore. Mm -hmm. And what little ones there are, it's like, you know, a lot of them are little, and they don't know what they're doing themselves. Mm -hmm. So we bring people in for this event so that they could see how a model facility, you know, what, what production looks like in a model facility. And they're not going to know everything. They're not going to figure everything out. I've got my camera here. Wait. Here's here's some boot camp shots from. And I can get you more of these pictures. This guy's an environmental attorney in Austin. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we get people from everywhere. We've had people from Norway, from India, Mexico, Canada, U.S. I mean, from all over. Um, what, Senegal? I don't know everywhere we've gotten people. Um, but anyway, it gives people an opportunity to see, you know, how is production organized? You know, what? how do we bundle things? How do we sort things? How, how does all this stuff happen? Mm -hmm. So, and we have a blast. It's, we have a lot of fun. So people who have never sewn before, and they leave sewing. You know, that doesn't mean they can do a whole garment construction and everything, but, mm -hmm. so... It's a lot of fun. Try my fire. It's like, drop them in. Yeah, it's great. It's great. <laughs> it's great. But the thing is, is that it fills up very, very quickly. It fills up in like 18 hours for the time that I announce it. Holy crap. Yes. They better subscribe to you I know, but quick. It's, it's funny because <laughs> I get people email me all the time. Oh, yeah, I heard about your boot camp. And I'm planning on signing up, Kathleen. And it's like, well, I don't know when. But, <laughs> I mean, it's like they think they're doing me a favor. It's like, no, no, no. You need to get on that waiting list. <laughs> <laughs> and then as soon as it's announced, sign up, you know? My video camera and I will be there to witness all the magic. I'm excited. It's fun. I'm excited. No, I've seen the pictures. Everyone looks like they're having a good time. Yeah, we do. We do. We have a great time, and we also and we do we get to do a really positive thing. So this, um, this March, we're going to be making kids' school pants. Mm -hmm. So kids' school pants. And in the fall, every fall, we make the kids' coats. Yeah, and it was the the thing that was really reaffirming this last time is our defect rate is um, our defect rate was like four percent, mm -hmm. and of course we repair everything except that one jacket I showed you. But on all of our defects, it was um, one side of one label was coming out. That's it. Yeah, that's beautiful. I know. Just whipping them into shape, Kathleen. No, I'm the one. I know if I do my no, you know, no, no, no. If I do my job right, if I do, the first day I'm in my office, but after that I'm working the floor. I'm sewing. Nice. Yes. No, I, I know we bring people in and they get assigned to be supervisors and coaches and managers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have seen a picture of Jamie. You'll see Jamie sooner or later, but she's the one who basically is, you know, runs the show now. You know, I sew. <laughs> you enjoy sewing? What's your favorite thing out of all the things that you do? I like really hard patterns. What's the hardest pattern you've ever done? I don't know. I did one. What, what's an example of a hard thing, though? Because I think people don't know what's really hard. No, they don't. Yeah. Because even myself, I will think, like, oh, that's going to be, you know, not too hard to draft. Mm -hmm. And then laugh at myself later. <laughs> yeah, famous last words, huh? Always. <laughs> yeah. Well, I like I like leather patterns. I like drafting leather patterns. I dra like drafting patterns that, for example, aren't, aren't 
aren't obvious. If something is well done, you don't notice that it's different. Mm -hmm. You know, like that little vest I was showing you right there. Mm -hmm. Do you know the front pieces are all different pieces? Can we show this on camera? Absolutely. It's like, no, that's mine. So it is designed. It's 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 seeing bad bad times, but okay. Let me angle my camera down. There we go. Okay. So anyway, so. These days, people basically will make something and they'll just make it overlap here and they call, you know, call it good, right? Mm -hmm. They call well enough alone. Not me. Of course not. Of course not. Mine, this, with the overlap and everything, is set up so that when it's, when it's set up, when the buttons are on it, mm -hmm. we have a perfect V right here. Do you see this? Ooh. So you've moved this, oh, okay. Instead so, of the slightly asymmetrical. So it's not like this. This is how everybody does it now. It's like people have forgotten we used to be able to yeah. do it. Yeah. Right. No, mine all do this. That's nice. So, but it means that this piece and this piece are not mirrored pieces of this. So no cut two. That's right. All the cut one, right side up. Right, right, mm -hmm. right, right. Yeah, so I like that kind of stuff. I like, you know, you know, I'm like pleasantly satisfied if I've got at least 50 pattern pieces to a pattern. You know, I start getting totally happy and into the zen of it if I start going upwards of that. It's like, everybody leave me alone. I'm like a pig and slop. <laughs> so, can you, oh God, this is, this is probably going to sound like an ignorant question, but can you... Explain a couple of the main differences between pattern making for leather versus wovens. Or is that like a, do you have a semester's worth of time? Or? No, I can tell you a couple things. I mean, okay. it's different. Um, I Leather is really neat to sew with. And I really, boy, I wish I could get people to experiment with it more. because they I just, love sewing leather. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, on the internet, there's just all the stuff out there. And most of it's BS. People who are just repeating other BS that they learned, and that, that's the way they learn to say, think that's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. And they basically teach people to be afraid of it, you know. And I just think, you know, just grab a scrap of leather and just put it on the needle and see what happens, you know. But leather is really is a nice material to work with. Um, I mean, I've learned some things the hard way. You can pull down that black jacket right there. So this jacket I made 25 years ago. And it, I, didn't, I didn't even know it was in here. We were showing it to another customer, I think. But this right here, um, I did learn some... Okay, like, you know when you're making your facings and stuff, you know how you have to cut the facings back and they can't be an exact match to the neckline? You know, because you can't have areas still... Uh, it's a matter of physics. You can't have two things in the same place. Mm -hmm. You know? And that becomes very, very noticeable in leather. So... This pattern is actually, because it's so thick, this is, I, I don't know, it's like a four and a half ounce. Mm -hmm. We actually had to cut this. You see how we've got this curl right there? Mm -hmm. Do you see that? It's because the facing still isn't small enough. Mm -hmm. And the facing is already three eighths of an inch smaller than the shell. Mm -hmm. Because it's so bulky and it's so curved, like right in there, it has to be engineered to lay it has to it down. Be, yeah, so it's already three eighths of an inch smaller than the shell. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. So, so I did learn that. I mean, that that's interesting. And then it's that's. Um, I mean, like, okay, you know how people like to argue about whether there's such a thing as sleeve cappies. It's like, okay. <laughs> I remember this. <laughs> it's like. All right, start sewing in leather sleeves and then come and talk to me. <laughs> yeah, because these have to be smaller than the armhole, or they're just not going to go in. You know. <sighs> Sleeve cap eases. I'm very um, anti. The, the, no, it's 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 sloppy pattern making. Right. Yeah. Like, even as I was learning it in school, I thought it was BS. And I'm just like, this is weird. I don't like this. It is. Yeah. So these sleeves are actually three-eighths of an inch smaller than this armhole. They had to be because there was no other way to get them in. Yeah, because, again, with the bulk and the got curvature. ID, you've yeah. got ID and OD. You have ID and OD. Now, if you're dealing with 
thin, lightweight fabric, the difference is minimal, maybe one sixty-fourth of an inch, so nobody notices, right? Mm -hmm. You can, like, crowd it in. Yeah. <clears throat> Once you're dealing with something that's two, three, four, five ounces, mm -hmm. you know, if you calculate one sixteenth of an inch per ounce, what are you looking at by the time you get to right. four ounces, right? Your mm -hmm. minimum looking at a quarter of an inch. And then you just get puckery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you've got ID and OD. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got the, you know, outer diameter and the inner diameter, okay? This right. has got to be smaller to fit into here. Yep. And that's what that, that's the issue. So, but anyway. Yeah. Thickness of the leather versus yeah. the curvature. People, yeah, and you can wash leather and you can iron it and you can do all kinds of things to it. I think you should do whatever you want to it. But yeah, it's like my favorite material to work with. So, it's not hard, you know. I love working with leather. Yeah, and it impresses people, so why not, right? And then I like to do <laughs> things like this. You can pull that one out. I don't know why that one. These things were not placed strategically here for your visit. I'm just lucky is all. All right, so you see we've got these seams going around here. And as you mm -hmm. can imagine, this can get a little heavy, right? Mm -hmm. Because we've got this, you know, we've got a facing here, see? So, so just imagine how heavy that's going to be. So it's the shelf fabric doubled over, and then yeah. at the seam allowance, it's, mm -hmm. it's quadrupled over. Right. Okay, so why don't you feel that? Why don't you stick your hand in there and feel that? Do you have interfacing in there? Yes, of course. Yes. No, did you feel that? You didn't, you didn't make the appropriate response. What's the appropriate response? It's very stiff, but I don't feel the, the, the seam allowance. You don't. It's amazing. <sighs> I feel like I got some sort of like quiz question That's correct right. by not feeling the hem allowance right. in there. <laughs> There's the seam allowance. There's the side seam. Of course you have a seam allowance, but you don't feel it. And there's the... Did you graduate the hem allowance? No, this is the side. I broke up this, this piece right here. Uh-huh. It is not the same shape for the hem facing. Do you see this? I broke it right here where there's no... I created, do you see? Oh. You see? I created a, a, a seam right here where there was no seam here. Mm -hmm. And then I eliminated the seam at here at the side seam. Mm -hmm. Right? And then created another seam right here where there was no seam here. Ah, so what you're essentially doing is... Like, normally, people would make them identical, and so you would have a really bulky side seam right. because all that... The, right. the outside seam allowances and the facing seam allowances, they would be all bunched right. together in one spot, but you move the facing yeah. and the outer mm -hmm. seams, and so it's just like the whole thing looks smoother. Now, look at, now this is just mock-up fabric that mm -hmm. we use, okay? This is not like any fancy fabric. This is just what we use for mock-up. Mm -hmm. So isn't the mat cool? That is cool. That that looks hard to sew, though. That that actually, it's not, actually, if you do it in really small seams, it's really yeah. not that bad. Okay, and then of course I like to show off. So there's the back. <laughs> <laughs> I did tell my viewers that there was just going to be a lot of you and me like talking about things mm -hmm. and just like rambling on. <laughs> oh, good, good. All right. So what are other questions we have? All right. So we talk about this on a couple of occasions, but for people who are I mean, I call them all my students because they're my students. So whether they're in school studying to be a designer or they are trying to teach themselves, mm -hmm. what are some of the things that you think they should really focus on if their ultimate goal is to have their own line? Oh, okay. They're going to teach themselves? Well, some, some students do. Like, they can't afford school. Mm hmm And so they have to figure out how to do this on their own. And then I do have a lot of students who are in a fashion right, right, program. Right, right, right. But there are things that... Uh, actually, somebody. just gumption. Just gumption, because this is the tragic thing that nobody wants to hear. But most of, most of the people that I've worked with that make it don't have design school backgrounds. So that's most... That's over 75%. Don't... Never went to fashion school. Yeah, I don't think people need to go to school. I think... And I'm going to do a video on this later on, but the things that you learn in fashion school aren't... Like, there are some it, good things. There are some good. I mean, I if you especially if you're going to be a technical person, you must go. Well, it's funny because I went and interviewed a couple of my girlfriends who are design directors in LA. Okay. 
And one of the questions I asked them both was, what did you learn in fashion school that has like continued to be invaluable to you now? Because they went to school with me, so they graduated like a million years ago. And they're like, they answered separately, but they answered the same kind of stuff. They learned how to manage time mm -hmm. and how to work really hard and the limits of how hard they could work and, you know, work process and things like that and not like individual skills right. so much. Right. And I think that that's something that not a lot of self-educated people can get mm -hmm. is, you know, in school you have someone really pushing you. Yeah, but they come from other businesses too. People come from other businesses, and so it's... I think they do better off because they have a work experience, right. but I'm also there. I also have people who who don't. There's yeah. they're also in their early twenties, mm -hmm. and they don't have a lot of job history elsewhere, and they don't have the fashion school background. Yeah, it can be challenging. So yeah, a lot of you know, explain gumption to. My viewers, what you Just, mean by that? You know, there's, the, there's an old saying, word to the wise is sufficient. A word to the wise is sufficient. So if you come and you ask somebody for advice, you know, and they give you some advice and you don't follow it, but you come back for more advice and they, okay, give you more advice and you also don't follow it. The third time you come back for more advice, and it's like this is like in a public arena, mm -hmm. okay? This literally happens to me. Mm-hmm. And I can't, by then, I just want to reach to the screen and smack the person. Mm -hmm. But there's all these other people who aren't party to what's been going on. So they don't know that this person has asked me yet another question for the third time, not having done, mm -hmm. followed any of my previous advice. Mm -hmm. Fourth time. There was a fourth time. There was a fourth time when I will unload and I will say, you know what, you, you're just insulting me now. Mm -hmm. You're just insulting me. You're not following up, you know... You're taking advantage of me and my time. Mm -hmm. So it's actually doing what somebody says. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have, I don't have a vested interest in whether somebody follows my advice or not. Mm -hmm. So if I give you, if I make that time to give you some advice, do it. Then come back. Mm -hmm. You know, and tell me how wrong I was. I'm more than thrilled mm -hmm. when I hear that. So, but it's mostly that, and it's mostly people who. Take the lazy way out. You know, they're looking for a bullet point list on how they can make their, you know, dreams come true. And the other thing is that people need to learn that maybe they really don't want to be a designer. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because I run into people all the time, and I, I consider this like my gift. I run into these design students and mm -hmm. found out they're not really designers. You know, and I t touch them and say, it's okay, you don't have to be a designer. Totally. And they become pattern makers. And it's awesome. And they make way more money than and designers they make way do. more money. Than <laughs> they get into something else, you know, and I've yeah. had them, them be like relieved. Oh, I thought I had to be a designer because I went to fashion designer school. And some of them were like really hot about marketing and, mm -hmm. you know, becoming sales reps. And mm -hmm. it's just, it's a centralized, you know, education and you can branch off from there, you know, do what you like. Yeah. You know? So, it's this funny thing. It's like there's these two, two kind of programs that, like, kind of in U.S. universities, you either have these kind of vague programs like liberal arts, mm -hmm. where you take this program and then you don't do anything with it, and you go into a career that has really nothing to do with liberal arts, or you know, mm -hmm. you just go get a job. And but if you go to a school where your degree as specific like fashion design people think oh no I have to go right. into fashion design or I'm a failure right. they're like I see students lock themselves into that yeah. I'm like well no it's about taking the information you learn in your degree and then building the career that right. you want out of it right and if you don't use every day that's fine you that's use okay. the stuff that that's applies okay. to you yeah and I can tell you what I wish people would learn <laughs> I can tell you what tell I us please yeah. um math the only person I know that that says I wish I'd learned more math. So I do math every day, all day, all day long. I do have a lot of junior high and high school students yeah. who watch, and I'm like, no, 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 you have to, you have to really learn fractions mm -hmm. if you do pattern making in the U.S. That's right. 
No, even as a designer, you need to be able to add and subtract and multiply. Mm -hmm. You do a lot, a lot of math. Mm -hmm. A lot of math. And math will not scare the art away. I guarantee you. Um, it's knowing how, understanding that as a designer, your key, your the number one thing you are doing is you, you're actually a project manager. And I wish I could get people to understand this. Somebody's in charge and it's you. Mm -hmm. You're leading the show and you need to bring all these components of everything all together mm -hmm. and do it successfully and on time. You know, so it's a very challenging job. It's not a job I would want to do. <laughs> no way. I uh -uh, no, because because designers get blamed for everything. You know, that's the thing. That's the thing. Being a designer doesn't pay. And it then, does not. And then you get you get you know um, you get blamed for everything that goes wrong. They're always the first to get fired if a collection mm -hmm. doesn't sell. That's right. That's right. Doesn't matter if there was a problem in distribution. That's right. Crazy promises made by sales reps. It doesn't matter I at all. I know. I know. It's it's always that's because they always I'm assume saying. like if the design was good enough, it would have overcome all those other problems. And since your designs weren't good enough, <coughs> bye bye. What we were talking about? So we were talking about designers being project managers more than anything, and how they get blamed. Oh, they get when they get canned a lot. They get canned. But you know, it's always it's always been that has always been an understanding of the business. So if you're mm -hmm. a designer, you get canned a lot. Even 35 years ago. It was not considered, it wasn't really held against you, you know, it really wasn't. And it was just something that was, you know, par for the course. You just went from place to place to place and probably made designers more vibrant. Yeah, know? I did hear when and I was resilient. first getting started, I, I had a, a meeting with like our, the school job person, job resources person, and she's like, fashion is one of those industries where if you change jobs every year, it's one of the few industries where that's not... A terrible thing. Well, except the technical people, that is a bad thing. Yeah. Well, that's you know, yeah, that's different. Yeah, your technical people—they're changing jobs. It means you're incompetent. Mm -hmm. But your designers, yeah, is not a job. It's a very difficult, difficult job, and it's always your fault. Mm -hmm. Everything's always your fault. You're held accountable. People yell at you. It's like, no, I do not want to. Sign <laughs> I'm gonna get so many comments on this video. I don't want to be a designer anymore, Zoe. Like, good, go be a pattern maker. <laughs> It's, it's just, you know what, the other thing is, you know, I mean, I get people all the time, they're like, well, what should I study, what kind of fashion degree should I get, and it's like, well, what do your parents want you to do? They want me to be an electrical engineer, and I'm like, yay, mom, you know, <laughs> you know or it's always, you know, my parents were accountants, and it's like, do that, get that, because you can always be, a, you can also be a designer. You know who my favorite designers are? Accountants. They're my favorite. They're my absolute Please, please favorite. explain. <laughs> because they're not afraid of math. Mm -hmm. They're not afraid. I mean, they look at something. They're not afraid to assign a value to something. Mm -hmm. Maybe like X amount of time. How much did that time cost you? Mm -hmm. How much did it cost you to, for somebody to complete that project? Mm -hmm. They're not afraid to look at the hard numbers. It's like, okay, a roll of fabric. It's $100. Okay? And how much of my product did my product use of that? They're mm -hmm. not afraid of numbers. Numbers give very good information and so that tells them it's like you know, your pulse, your respiration, your temperature mm -hmm. to a doctor. So they're not, they don't hide from that stuff. And so they figure out right away whether or not that's something that they can do. Mm -hmm. Or they find a way to make it work and they're, they're great to work with. They'll say, how can we do this? Mm -hmm. How can I, what can I do to make this cost lower? Mm -hmm. You know, as a matter of making more of these or, you know, mm -hmm. so you know, they're not you know, but the worst customer is one who, hold on a second, that, that is just driving me nuts. Okay. I don't know who that is. I adore her. I adore all my employees. I've known you for 10 years. I've figured it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So what were we talking about? Oh, accountants being my favorite customers. The and other your least favorite and customers are? Um, artists. They're the absolute worst. I'm serious. Bring it to me. Yeah. They're the worst. They're the worst. They, they, um, I mean, bless their hearts. <laughs> I mean, they're just, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, they're immensely talented. You know, I, I think it's awesome. They need to be brought into, I think, into organizations that are more robust, that mm -hmm. have a place for them and need their direction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but they're not ideal at starting companies. I always felt that those 
kinds of people need a partner. Like they can't do it on their right. own. You know, I was explaining to you how successful my husband's company has yeah. been. Mm-hmm. It's because, you know, in his field, my husband is the artist. Right. He's so into developing the software. Mm-hmm. He has no brain space for anything else. Like right. literally, I make fun of him because he doesn't know how to write a check. Like uh-huh. he literally doesn't know how to write a check. Okay. But he is... You know, people call him a software genius constantly. Right. He's so smart. He yeah. does not know how to write a check. His right. business partner, yeah. he he's the he's the guy who schmoozes. Mm-hmm. He's the guy who kind of figures out organization. Right. He does the sales. He mm-hmm. hired more salespeople. Like, mm-hmm. I, yeah, like if you are one of the more artistically inclined, like you're right. so in this headspace person, right. I don't think you can be successful without. Well, I, you know, I, don't, I don't know, but you'd have to... I mean, I have known artists who were very successful, too. I don't know how they did it. I didn't know them well enough to know. I think they have, like, the best assistant or partner that really helps them with keeping them on track and, like, doing the things that they might not want to do. Oh, no, I, love, I love having that energy. You know, we do get quite a few of them. I mean, they're just special. Hey, Zoe from Chapman Ellisor. Will you ask Kathleen what was the biggest error she has made while working in the industry and how she overcame it? Oh, that was easy. The biggest mistake <laughs> I ever made in this business was buying Optitech software. What's that? It's CAD software. It's Optitech. It was a brand and I got ripped off. And they just thought that I would never tell anybody about it. Oh. Yeah. And now you're telling more people about yes, it. Yes, I am. Because I have 30,000 subscribers. There you go. <laughs> That's right, and if they don't like it, they can refund my money, which I never got back. Oh, dang. Oh, yeah, basically I paid, you know, for a $10,000 doorstop. And then, the thing the thing that, you know, there's a lot of lessons to take from it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it took a long time to sort this stuff out. But there's a lot of people who have stumbling blocks and issues, of one thing or another. And if you're new to something, you don't know where the problem is. Like it's with software. Okay, you just think it's you. You don't know the software, so you just think that you're the one with the problem. Once you get a little more experience, you figure out you're in a position to judge. And so you know, no, it was the software. No, it was this person. Or no, it was this system. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's really hard. But, yeah, I didn't think I'd ever actually become digital, mm-hmm. you know, until I got this other CAD software, which is great, style CAD. And um, the thing I like about it best is that it's particularly good for people who learn to make patterns by hand. Because basically, I can still make patterns by hand, I just do it in the computer. Mm-hmm. So I don't have to do all this crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. So, But it's, it's a great company. It's a great, it's a small company. It's a Korean company, actually. So Wait, this is not the company you were bashing a second ago? No. What's, what's the company you use now? StyleCAD. StyleCAD. Yeah. And they're awesome. Yeah, and it was funny because they came up in a discussion on our forum. We have a private members forum, as you know. You are mm-hmm. a member for however long. And um, and I can't remember. Somebody was talking about this. Two girls were kind of, kind of, you know, loggerheads about the software, and they were going back and forth. And I just said, "Well, you guys could just calm down. It's not that great a thing. If I've never heard of it, <laughs> <laughs> can't be that good." <laughs> Can't be that good if I haven't heard of it. But, no, it's great. They just don't do any marketing. They just don't do any marketing, but it's the and it costs as much as Optitex and everything else does. It costs as, costs as much as Gerber and Optitex and Electra. It's not any cheaper. It's just better. All right. So, so you promised us two demos: one on the CAD and one on Welt Pockets, right? Oh, CAD. So I can show you. Grading is gonna. It's like. I get other computer users in here, and they think, yeah, this is great, this is wonderful, but it's not until I show them grading that they freak out. 